you have a big layback, yeah, this might be total nonsense. If you have a big layback and you want to stop to sample or something like that, you're not going to be able to stop and sample and like spend all day there. But if you stop the ship, do you think it slows down Argus's swing at all? Uh, Eventually. Yeah. Not initially? No. Yeah, because Argus is still in motion, so object in motion stays in motion. Yeah, yeah. So, but eventually maybe gives you buys you like seconds, probably not much. So the only advantage is really that you have of stopping the ship for when you're way laid back is that you have some time to deal with getting yourself untangled if you get behind yeah, or whatever. Yeah, I agree, and it kind of gives you an opportunity to yeah reduce that layback and. Mm -hmm. Well, depending on the layback too, it will pendulum a little bit. It'll go, it'll go past where it wants to settle and then come back mm -hmm. a little bit. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, are you in auto XY? I am not. We get a slight tilt, Gabby. Yes. C pen must have been really heavy. <laughs> okay. Go for Zoom. Shrimp. Looks very similar to the shrimp that we came up on that sponge the other day. Oh, and a tiny slime star to the right-hand side, too. Oh, nice spot. A little pink, kind of pink looking. Was an interesting sponge shape. Okay, go ahead. Treta pleura. Remember that sponge? It's going to be a long day in the lab tomorrow, or later today. Oh, yeah. I think it's during the daylight hours. Hey, you have 40 plus samples? Ooh. Yeah, j today it's, uh, we started at 21. Ah, okay. And we're at 16. But uh, some of them are very, very involved collections, like the wood, the wood fall. What will it's you have to do to take a long time? Um, 
This is, uh, looks like a stoloniferous in here. This, we collected a piece of that yesterday. Stoloniferous octocoral on top of a, a sponge rubble. The woodfall, um, a lot of the animals in a woodfall are inside of the wood. And uh, they're often very fragile. So we'll need to, to the best of our ability, break apart some of the wood into smaller fragments so that it can be preserved oh, properly. Wow. Okay. Uh, Do you have to like extract the animals out? You know, so it depends on in what state the wood falls in. If it's in a very okay, go ahead. poor state, it'll probably disintegrate. So, you know, in that case, we can probably just break off smaller pieces and then preserve some of the wood along with the animals so that folks who know more about the anatomy of these critters can do the dissection themselves. Okay. Um, but, it, you know, it, it depends what's there. I think they probably have a few wood boring mollusks and as well as uh, some echinoderms on there, but we'll have to pick all those off and uh, image them separately. What else that we had? Do we have that? Can I see this for a second? Sea stars are pretty easy. The sponges are pretty easy. Sea pigs are really easy. It might not take that long. Push cores um, potentially could take a while, depending on what we need to do with them. But typically, uh, for a push core, we don't do much sectioning here unless it's specifically a very prescribed methodology. We'll just cap them, trim them, cap them, and uh, secure them so that when they ship, they can be unpacked at the core repository. different things here. So Steve, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, we talked a little bit about broadcast spawning of sponges, but another question that came in is, have sponges, can they ever separate off and then basically establish themselves somewhere else and start growing? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, most of them, if they detach, provided they're not smothered, uh, by the sediment, um, they can re reattach themselves uh, if given enough time. Um, I'm not sure about maybe the, the really long stalked ones, um, but definitely if it's kind of this more amorphous sponge or lobate sponges, they going? typically will reattach multiple places you know, if they're growing on the edge of a rock or something. Mm, that makes sense. Oh, what are There's you? Big one. Speaking of sponges. Dead sponge? 
That's still standing? Oh, yeah. With lots of something on it? Oh, yeah, solitary hydroids there. Wow. Cool. Oh, whoa. That's really cool. Yeah, those are solitary hydroids. Can I get bubble back for a sec? Yep. Thank you. See if I can get a good image of this guy. Yeah, these these sponges are pretty nice habitat for a lot of other encrusting animals, attached animals, suspension feeders. This would actually be a really nice okay, zoom if we could get again. imagery oh, on I'm it. Good, I'm done. Maybe do one without the lasers too. After oh, we, uh, do that. Kind of looks like a flower garden. It really does. Yeah. Oh wow, that's beautiful. Oh, there's so many. They're not so solitary. A huge little. Solitary hydride party. Is that one of those long spine urchins on the left there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That's actually one of the ones that I think they collected a bit earlier. It's so wee. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Did you want more of the base of the solitary hydrides there? Uh, I think that's okay. Okay. Okay, onward. That was pretty neat. That was very neat. It's such a funny shape of a sponge. Yeah. From this angle, it reminds me of those, like, remember those seats that were, like, hands? Oh, yeah, that yeah. That you could sit in? Or, like, a, totally. it looks so curved. I'm wondering if they would, just looking at the weather forecast for the winds midday today, if the reason why they want to recover after breakfast is that the winds are expected to pick up. Nav, have you seen the forecast? Uh, yeah, I just pulled up windy. Look terrible. Is it really? Uh, no, it doesn't look too, too, too bad. I mean, it comes up. Funny, this call for the wind to come up and the swell to come down. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, I'd like some more rocks, please. More rocks? More rocks, bigger ones. Yep. Covered with critters. You have to reach one thousand eight hundred and forty-six meters. Ooh. Oh, okay. Well, it's oh, only a thousand meters. Not to collect, just even to look at. This oh, is... okay. <laughs> is looking somewhat nodule -y. very nodule -y. A nodule barren. Yeah, here. exactly. Yeah, if you zoom in, though, it's not so barren. You probably okay. see a lot of small things. Challenge accepted. I know there's a lot of hazards to navigation here, but if you could manage <laughs> <to> zoom. <laughs> it's too difficult. Can't do it. Okay, I found a spot with a little thing in it already. Let's get a zoom. Yep. 
pretty lumpy nodules. Not very clean. I'm just going to float up a little bit so we can see. Yeah, even areas. if you feel comfortable just kind of moving yeah. across the bottom in a moderate yeah. to tight zoom, you can probably. Yeah, let's do a half zoom. I think if we're really tight, it'll just like be blurry, just disorienting. But, well, there's a little macaroni sponge there, lower right corner. Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay, let's see how this goes. There's something tiny. There are a bunch of things like small polychaete worms in this nodule field that I'm seeing. Not very large, some small crustaceans. Oh yeah, a little shrimpy. A lot of the research in the Clarion Clipperton zone on uh, nodules has actually yielded many, many new species of worms. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, there's a little, maybe anemone there. Yep. Anemone. anemone. Yeah, anemone, maybe a, a serianthid anemone, even tube anemone. Good zoom. We saw a bunch of things, the nodules we didn't, wouldn't normally see from higher up. Bridge nav. Can we please move 100 meters, bearing 160? 160. Thank you. I'm looking on the sonar. I don't see I don't see an end to this yet. Just a lot of nodules. Yeah.
Oh, hey. Sponge. Are we back where, is it the same sponge? Is it a different sponge? Different. Different. Different sponge. Similar though. I haven't seen very many live ones like this. If any. Go for zoom. Cover it with four minute friends. Okay, go on. Steve, when we see rocks like this in a big, like, nodule plain, is it most likely that they tumbled down and landed here, and that's why they're there, or they could does that be. not necessarily matter? Uh, it's tough to tell because you don't know how deep the sediment is here. You know, we are on the side of a volcano. The sediment can't go on forever. Yeah. So the... More than likely, you know, it could just be a large boulder that's attached firmly in place, or it could have fallen down from higher up. So there's no no real way of knowing until you excavate it. Yeah. But you, you can probably have a good assumption that the larger the boulder, the less likely it is to move. Uh, which is why you will get bigger things growing on them. Bigger and longer lived things, like corals and sponges. Like just in front of us. Can we look at the one on the right hand side, that coral? Uh, the long stringy uh, one? No, the yellowish one. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, totally. Wow, this, this one might be a new depth record if it is what I think it is. From my own memory, not Go for zoom. officially. Can we, can we uh, do a sampling here? Maybe a snip of this um, okay. yellow coral, or are we going to move too far? Bridge, nav. Go wide. Josh, you want I'll to get stop, this one? I'll stop, please. Sure. If possible, can we s sit down and get a um, yeah. tight zoom on it first? Yeah. We'll need a nice, stable way to sit anyways. Okay, go for zoom. Yeah, this is flexorid for sure. Not one that I immediately recognize either. With these, it's really tough. You're going to have to get a sample and off, often to identify it. Okay, but go we wide. Can put it in that family. So um, we can probably do a snip. Uh, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe right here, that portion. Might okay. be the easiest to snip, or even you know a branch like this. Where do you want to put it? We can put it in the forward bio box, same compartment A. Okay. It's pretty distinct. Come in, please. Uh, it, you're, it's definitely going to be a cut, not a not a break, because uh, it's a pretty flexy skeleton. Yeah.
Tilt out, please. Uh, zoom in. Good, thanks. Is that enough there? Yeah, great. Come wide. Rack all the way back. Do we need any more imaging here before it goes? Uh, yeah, can we get a zoom? We have time sure. on the draw. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, flexor red for sure. Nice, okay. All set. Do this still. Uh, what, did you say right hand side? Uh, le left hand side if you can. Left hand side. Port side. Thank you. Cool. Nice. Ready to go? Ready to go. Cool. I'll make a note that several there were several fragments you saw, yeah. Make sure we get all those in the same bin. So Steve, you were saying, or you're interested in that sample because it's a new depth that we're seeing in that potentially? Yeah, we start to see the plexorids around 1,800 meters, 17, 1,800 meters. So it's a bit deeper, uh, but no, not, not outrageously deep. Um, but at the same time, these plexorids are very difficult to identify in situ. Here's our biggest coral yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a good size one. I knew the summit was going to get interesting. <laughs> Pass it off to the next watch. <laughs> Still 40 minutes. I mean, we could go the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> go for Zoom? No, we won't do that to them. Four to eight has been cursed with blue water for too long. Might that's as well true. give them something to look that's, forward to. That's true. They deserve this. This looks like a J-clay bamboo coral. Okay, go on. We've got a little catching up to do here. Um, yeah, and the, the other component, why we want to sample these plexorids, not only are they hard to identify uh, from the seafloor observations, uh, they are also one of the targets that we're interested in characterizing with our eDNA collections. So if we have a specimen of it, uh, we can isolate uh, DNA extracts from it and have a very good idea what the sequence material we are looking for in the eDNA profile looks like if they're shedding. Okay, we uh, can gotcha. start up again if you cells want. Cells into the water. Let's move. Bridge, nav. We are ready to get underway. Can we please move 100 meters, bearing 160? Thank you. Go for Zoom. Brussels sprouts. <laughs> or is that macaroni? 
No, that's Brussels. Oh, oh. yeah. Oh, man. I, <laughs> I've, my confidence is destroyed. <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to being a deep sea biologist. <laughs> my confidence is destroyed. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Just multiply that by 10 is what I feel on a daily basis about <laughs> corals, especially yellow corals. <laughs> I told the last cruise, like these yellow fans, they're definitely the ones that remake you think your life choices about <laughs> studying corals. Why? <laughs> yeah, I just feel like that's more serious than the fact that I can't place sponges in my made up taxonomy <laughs> of food. <laughs> <laughs> like since I made up the names, like it really could be any of them. <laughs> I could just give it a new name. Oh, what you want, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which ones are the yellow corals? I'm not even sure I know what you mean by that. So I, I th there's multiple different kinds of yellow corals, but you, generally they belong to a couple different families, either the Plexoridae or the Acanthogorgiidae. Go for zoom. This will be a quick one. Uh, which are very closely related themselves. It's kind of an interesting Chrysogorgia morphology there. Most likely Chrysogorgia Go genus. On. Sorry, yellow corals. Yeah, so Plexorids or Acanthogorgids. Um, generally, the they, they're pretty color variable, but yellow is the predominant one we find in the deep here. Although they can be dark purple or dark blue, green. Um, what else? All all of those colors combined sometimes <laughs> on one colony. Wow! Well, oh, have really? we seen these? Um, they're they're not as common down here. But if you were to go shallower than fifteen hundred meters, shallower than a thousand meters, they they explode in diversity. Okay. And the shallower you get, so these are probably most likely shallow water corals that have invaded the deep sea. So they have originated in the shallows and diversified there, but you know, some of them have extended into the deep sea, some lineages. So they're typically sh uh, more diverse shallower in the mesophotic environments. There was a paper that just came out from uh, To look it up. Uh, I think it was from Juan Sanchez's lab. He's an octocoral uh, specialist uh, that said that a lot of the mesophotic coral species um, had among among the shallow and deep water corals, mesophotic uh, coral lineages uh, diversified Go for zoom? fastest. Nope, never mind. Over the past uh, 100 million years or so. Okay, let's try again. Go for Zoom. In fact, I have that paper on my laptop. I was actually in the midst of reading it earlier today. Okay, that's macaroni, though. Yeah, except that it's right? tall like a Brussels sprout. Oh. No, no, I would, no, no. I was no just insight. thinking about how I like to put Brussels sprouts in my macaroni, but <laughs> <laughs> the thought I got stuck on <laughs> is I'm a little bit hungry. <laughs> it does sound really good.
I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. Sometimes you think you're looking at something and then you get there and it's actually just like a shadow or it was never there. Go for zoom. Especially this, it's almost the same color as the sediment yeah. and like mm -hmm. the right lighting. Not not healthy looking macaroni sponge. Yeah, they're usually that iridescent white. It needs to sneeze. <laughs> okay, go wide. Sneeze it out, macaroni. I can't wait to watch that video. I know. I'm really <laughs> excited. Could sponges ever get cleaned by a change in current that flows a different direction? Uh... I guess they could, but I think the conventional wisdom is that they are specialized to a certain current direction, you know, prevailing current direction. So I, I don't know if, if the if a reverse current would be strong enough uh, to do that. We know very little about kind of the hydrology, uh, you know, hy hydrography of a lot of these seamount environments. Um, to really say if there, if those currents even exist, since a lot of these corals and sponges are pretty slow Go growing, if they start growing in a certain direction, they typically don't stop. They'll typically follow that trend. Until this they isn't fall over. the first time I've seen this. Like a, as a really close pairing here. Yeah. Bathypathies and uh, or you mean the yeah the bathypathies and the uh, whatever the sponges. Maybe a dead macaroni Brussels sprout thing. Yeah. Dinner. Yeah. <laughs> dead foraminiferans and some fertile yeah. stars. Yeah. It's very close. They often have higher species diversity after they've died. Sponges. Oh, neat. Might be some shrimp in there as well as, you know, sometimes squat lobsters live inside the structures. Go wide. So the sponge must have something defensive on it to keep the diversity down on its surface so that it can do yeah, spongy things. It could. It could. Or maybe just being made of glass is defensive enough. I, it certainly works on us. That's a great segue into a question we just got in the chat. Are all sponges glass oriented or are some made of different compounds? And all the ones we are seeing are the glass oriented and the silica based, but talked about this a little earlier on our watch. There's a few other different types of sponges. So I think there is calcareous was one type, some that are uh, made of spongin. So a few different compound types, but we are not seeing those sponges down here at this step. Another viewer asking us what depth we are in the ocean right now. And we are at 
19, seven, <laughs> 1,974 meters. Um, and if you go to the Nautilus Live homepage to watch our live stream, you can actually see um, some of our live data there. So we have ROV Hercules depth along with Argus water temperature and our ship heading. So you can watch um, that change as we go either up or down exploring. So you can always check there too. Is that another one of the sea stars on the right-hand side? Not just off screen? Oh, ravioli. ravioli sea star? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I don't know how you saw that. That was amazing. <laughs> ravioli on the mind. Yeah. Or is that oh, a base? Oh, it looks like. Can't tell. Doesn't look oh, like maybe it's right just shape. a sponge base. Go for zoom. Oh, rats. Mm -hmm. Sponge base. And brittle star. Okay, go ahead. Next time I make ravioli, I'm gonna make it five-sided. <laughs> I also There's like, like the, um, the five-sided Pop-Tart idea. Like oh, I like that too. <laughs> I do not make ravioli often, but now I want to make it more often. It's like a once-in-a-lifetime sort of creation. But now that I know that I can make it sea <laughs> star shaped, it's gonna things are going to change around here. We can do a tag team galley takeover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is going to be the filling of your five-sided ravioli? I like sweet potatoes a lot, Ooh, yum. or I like um, definitely oh. cheese. Lobster, lobster ravioli. Oh, oh yeah, sounds good. Not starfish. Doesn't not look not like realistic, you know, gonadal material. <laughs> We, we actually have like a press to make ravioli at home, and I bet <laughs> you could like 3D print a five-sided one. Oh. I'll send you a photo someday if I think. Yeah, yeah, you definitely should should 3D print a five-sided ravioli <laughs> press. <laughs> that would actually be really cool. 3D printed Coney Asteroids. Probably get some pretty good detail on those. Nice uh, stickopathies, orange black coral. Where? Oh, to the right. Uh, right, right, right. The right. the the stick. Oh, the stick. Oh. Whip. That's a black coral. Yep. Oh, cool. Okay, well, let's go take a look. I haven't seen one this dive, so I suspect it's. Uh, we saw one on the last dive. Or a few. I can't remember if so. The stickopathies is go for zoom. Kind of a catch-all group for a lot of these unbranched bamboo coral or uh, 
Un unbranched black corals. So, yeah, like, for example, the one in the background, that yellow one, mm -hmm. as well as the one in the foreground, historically we would both call those stichopathies. It turns out they're not all stichopathies. Stichopathies actually are uh, originally, I think it's mesophotic uh, corals. So they're, they're, they're being reclassified into something else. Uh, I can't remember if the paper's come out recently or if it needs to come out still. Yeah, this, this gives you a good idea, too, of the anatomy of the black corals. You can see the little dark dots that are on the um, closer to the skeleton are the mouth parts. And then the tentacles in pairs cool. of uh, three pairs of two uh, are the, the hex six pattern. Oh, yeah. Huh. Okay, go on. Great shot. So is it called... Stichopathies, because it's just a stick Math. version of the, or is that like spelled differently? It's um, sticko with a S T I C H O. Oh, yeah. okay. So that's there's a Greek translation to that. Oh, we've got and an I old. Don't quite remember it. Old coral here. Stico, arranged in parallel rows or lines. Oh, so a lot like sticks. Yeah. That makes sense. And it happens every four hours. Can we take a look at that one? Uh, half zoom. Yeah, that, that one's a primnoid. That one might be Paracalyptrophora. Did you see any associates on that? Well, I guess we're not very zoomed in. What is it? If 
thought I saw a shrimp or a crinoid. Could also be Norella, not sure. Oh, hello, sponge. <laughs> oh. Definitely feels like we're seeing some bigger corals. Ooh, a little fish. Zoom. Mushroom coral. Anthemastus or a pseudo anthemastus. The little guy. Okay, go like. There's some unbranched bamboos starting again. Oh, yep. Classic. I would have expected to see at least them, even in some of these more rubbly parts uh, over the course of the dive. We saw them deeper and disappeared for a bit. Now they're back. Probably different species, though.
got a viewer asking if it's usually completely dark at this depth. And the answer is yes. There is no light making it down this way. And if you look at our quad view, or um, feed number two on Nautilus Live, you can see the Argus kind of looking down at Herc. Um, and you can see where Herc's lights are. But everything around it, it's very, very dark. Um, uh, which is why these corals down here are pretty different than the shallow water corals you often think of um, that can use light to make energy, but down here these corals are filter feeding. Um, so since there's no light, they've got to get their food and energy a different way. Candidella gigantea, that uh, unbranched whip there. Oh yeah, okay. You can do a half zoom on that. Sure. To confirm. I don't think we've seen too many of those this dive. Go for zoom. Yeah. Is that what you think it is? Um, actually, could you go in a little bit more? Yeah, totally. The density of this, uh, it's probably Candidella gigantea, but the polyp density is, is high. So I'm going to stick with that, that for now. Okay. Um, it does look unusual. There are some um, unbranched Norella colonies as well, but I'm not familiar with any of them in this area. Norella is a primnoid? Right. You can usually tell pretty easily if the polyps had been um, retracted and contracted at all. They uh, tend to um, have what's called a process of uh, polarization. So uh, polarization towards the tip of the colony would be you know, upwards pointing polyps or polarization down axis towards the base uh, would be another form uh, that's more common in Norella. Or sometimes they don't retra uh, retract in a, have any polarity at all. Uh, as in the case of Candidella, usually usually doesn't have um, polyps bending up or down. If anything, maybe slightly down, but uh, typically they kind of stick straight out the same thing with Peristinella, uh, very similar characteristics. Norella is usually down axis. Uh, and then for the other major fans, um, from node fans, Calyptrophora has both up and down, down axis clades. Um, and then Paracalyptrophora is usually all down axis. What else is there? What other primnodes are there? 